all of my history combined to say to me, you idiot, you turned away from all of those things that you were taught before and traveling 25 years down this road, all you need to do is look back and see where you were. So in my end is my beginning, as T.S. Eliot said. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Welcome back. Uh, we're continuing the conversation today with John D. Wise. He goes online as the Christian atheist. He's got a podcast of the same name. It's linked with today's show so that you can hear his story in a lot more detail. I've been really enjoying listening to the Christian atheist recently myself, John. And we heard the beginning of your story and the fact that you had been a philosophy professor for nearly 25 years as an atheist, but that in 2019 you reached a kind of crisis point. Um, your wife had died uh there had, it had been a difficult marriage you're 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 up front about that um but you'd kind of reached um a point where you had found someone that you almost saw as the ideal um jenny um the, the person who <laughs> is not on mic at the moment but is is your constant companion whenever you're recording she's your your producer of sorts um but um but you, yeah you, you you reached this uh this this critical moment where she said look I can't marry someone who isn't a Christian and and you, you knew yourself wouldn't want her to marry someone who wasn't a Christian. You, you were in this position, but where there, you felt like actually you were almost made for each other. Um, <laughs> yes. Now at one level I could, I can almost see that the skeptics may be listening to this episode saying, well, if you ever wanted motivated reasoning, <laughs> there's your reasoning right there. Um, you that know, you and many, many a person perhaps has been persuaded to, to cross the line because of you know their love for a person you know how, how many people have maybe converted to judaism so that they can marry the love of their life or, or islam or whatever it might be um okay so you've but you you recognized that fully i think at the time you the, the, the your your motivations were sort of pretty apparent to you as well and and as i understand it from listening to your story you didn't want to do anything that would be false to yourself that that would kind of go against that ultimate sort of uh you know the, the the commitment to truth that you felt you had that had to guide your life um so um and and maybe at this point we could introduce a person who isn't everyone's cup of tea but uh is an important part of your own story jordan peterson the well-known canadian psychologist uh who's who i've in i had the privilege of interviewing in the past myself but um tell us about what uh, what happened because uh, you started listening to his stuff um, at a certain point and it and it started to have a real impact on you didn't it so just just explain what what was going on there it did um, I, for for those 25 years um, while I was an atheist my wife was a Christian so I usually accompanied her to church but that was the extent of my of my um, reading of the Bible or any connection with Christianity um, during those 25 years um, and pretty much the Bible I thought was in my past. It was something that I'd kind of been bored away from. Um, but I picked up Peterson talking about um, the Bible in his Bible series. And suddenly those old stories started sounding new again. Like there was something else in them that I had missed. And that not only I had missed, but pretty much everybody in the churches I had grown up with had missed, and it seemed to me that the entire Christian world had missed. It's like God was speaking through those things, and we weren't listening. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't at that point. I wasn't thinking God, um, but actually, <laughs> here's an interesting fact: um, Peterson was the first person I ever heard talk about Christian atheists, and I thought to myself, mm. "Hey, that's a great name. I'm going to take out a." Um, uh, 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 one of the dot coms under the Christian atheist name and do some of a podcast or something on it. And nothing yeah. ever came of it. I did purchase it for a couple of months, but then I let it all drop. Um, so it, it just, that's sort of an interesting sidelight. I thought, well, that's a great name. Um, but yeah, so he, he, he actually revived for me the voice of God in his book. And it's like, mm. wow wow, there really is something more there that I never saw before. And taking the psychological perspective, um, I think was a good perspective because there's no greater psychologist than God. And God knows who's, who's, who he's speaking to. And he spoke to me through Jordan Peterson, whatever you think about Jordan Peterson. 
Um, He is a prophet, I think, um, in terms of a prophetic voice right now for our culture um, and played a huge part in my return to Christ, for sure. And and as I understand it, that was partly because uh, you were kind of facing a crisis moment yourself that, you know, you you were sort of you'd gone through a very difficult few years and uh, and in some ways, it was the practical dimension, I think, of his of his speaking and writing that, that kind of helped you to sort of to realize, actually, even though you weren't a Christian at this point, that that there were things actually about that ancient wisdom that, that could be helpful. There were psychological things that, that he was saying that were helpful. The, the ancient wisdom, because that's what, for me, captured me with Peterson. It's like, wait a second. These are the things I've always been taught. And now we understand that psychologically, these are the right principles. That's another one of those dovetailing moments where all of my history combined to say to me, you idiot, you turned away from all of those things that you were taught before. And traveling 25 years down this road, all you need to do is look back and see where you were. So in my end is my beginning, as T.S. Eliot said. I found, again, the truth of all of those things that were inculcated in me from childhood. And of course, that was huge in Mm. allowing me to turn back, right? Um, I think had I been an atheist from, from, you know, youth on up, I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. But I do know when I look back now that every moment was calculated by the divine author to bring me to that point at that moment. Um, And Jordan Peterson was one large chunk of it, but not by any means the only part. Mm. So tell us about what happened then um, as you'd gone through sort of, you know, starting to to be influenced at least by some of these things and, and realizing that there was a sort of faith element to your own atheism up to that point. You, you then reached this crisis, this sort of moment of decision almost with Jenny. Um, what What was it that kind of helped you to get across the line, as it were, in good conscience, knowing that you weren't simply doing this because you wanted to be with the love of your life? Uh, that that actually it made sense to believe in God. It made sense to embrace Christianity again. Well, tell, just, just take us through that journey. Those 25 years were, were tough for a lot of reasons. Like, like I said, my marriage, we found a way of making things work, but it was a tough marriage. She was, she was a tough woman <laughs> and I'm sure I was no piece of cake myself. Um, but we found a way to to make it work between us when you got to that point i suppose with jenny that we kind of left off on and and you were kind of like she said well i'd marry you tomorrow john right. if if you were a christian but you were still at this point an atheist you know i don't think it was the kalam cosmological argument that took you <laughs> over the, the 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 edge i actually say the the arguments for god were done for me they did nothing I- nothing. I knew them all. I knew them well. I think that there's good reason for God. The the arguments even now don't seem that persuasive to me because I try to trace things back to their origin. And usually people don't, Hmm. usually don't, people don't decide things on the basis of arguments, whatever we may say. Um, But with Jenny, what did it, and this is why I started talking about my wife, um, was that in her, I saw something that was ideal that Mm. was enfleshed. And that brought back to me my own frustration, ongoing frustration, because I had begun to think to myself, life is just a series of disillusioning. You start with all of these high ideals and each and every one gets taken away from you moment by moment by moment. And by the time I hit 2019, it's like none of this is real. Mm. Jenny became for me, a mini incarnation. She reinstantiated the incarnation of Christ for me. And in that sense, it's like, oh, the ideal can be real. And if I were to say that there were one realization that brought me around, it was that. But I mean, it wasn't like it was a, a snap thing. It was a slow realization that in Christ, all of those things that I don't understand are reconciled, even though it doesn't make sense to me, even though I can't pull it all together. 
And in a sense, that was the culmination of my philosophical journey too. Because what I'd learned was I left the faith saying to myself, I will only believe what I know to be true. No truth above all and at all costs. And so I pursued that. I said to myself, I will only believe what the best philosophers and what the scientists have to tell me. And so I studied science and I studied philosophy like crazy. But as C.S. Lewis said, those, all the books started to turn against me. And I started mm -hmm. to realize as time approached 2019, before I even met Jenny, that mm -hmm. all of these things kept pointing to God. One small example was the, in, the, in Plato's Republic. Plato talks, has, has Socrates talking about a figure that they're polishing to pre present a particular case. And this figure ends up being the very mirror of Christ. 400 years before Jesus was born, right? He mm -hmm. suffers all of these things. He is a perfect man. He's done everything right, and yet he suffers and is killed. And Socrates says, yet this, is the ma this man has lived the best life possible. And mm -hmm. that was Christ. And so I kept mm -hmm. finding him over and over again. When the greatest, one of the most important atheistic voices of the 20th century, Jean-Paul Sartre, tells me that God haunts our consciousness that he is endemic to the human consciousness. It's like, wait a second, you're telling me this? I came to you for the other side, not that side. <laughs> but he was right. And finally, in 2019, with Jenny, I looked in that mirror and I realized, yes, motivation, this is what I want. But what I want is Jesus through Jenny. And that, that's exactly what it's became. And it's been that way all through our marriage. She has reflected Christ to me to this day. I kiss her feet in the morning. She is, she is, she is Christ incarnate for me on this earth, which allows me to move beyond her to the transcendent realm of the real living God. And, and that's what finally made the decision. It was actually a, a specific day. I even name it. I think it was July 23rd in the, um, in the podcast mm. in 2019. I had come back from a, from a week in the Adirondacks and I gave up. I said, this is it. I believe. And in believing, what I came back to was theism. But by default, theism became Christianity because it was how I knew God. And as Lewis says, nothing else compares. It's, it's such an interesting story. It's, and, and obviously, as you say, Jenny was a significant part of it in kind of representing this ideal, this ideal that I guess you, as an atheist, you had either not thought about or, or kind of hadn't hadn't been presented to you in that way. But that, that somehow, as you say, she was the mirror through which you saw Christ again in a new way. And, and, and it's important, I think, to say at this point that the faith you came back to in that sense was quite different to the faith you left uh, as a young man because as you say you're a different person today uh you're you're more comfortable i think with having questions with with there being things that you you can't explain that you can't as it as it were you know reason your way to god uh and that kind of thing but you're kind of comfortable with having that kind of tension these days in that way absolutely yeah the, um, the faith that i had then was a faith that was i needed to know I needed to have mm. the answers. And if somebody would question me on something that I didn't know, I would, I would freeze up inside. And it's not like, I'm not going to leave go of this faith. And I thought to myself, why am I holding on that way? I, I can't justify it. But when I came back to Christ, it's like, I didn't lose any of my doubts I had before I was, when I was living as an atheist. Those doubts are still there, mm. which is another reason I call myself the Christian atheist. Mm. In, in one sense, I'm exactly the same person I was as an atheist, it's still all there. All of those doubts are still there. It's just that now I recognize I don't know these things. I believe them. I choose to believe them. And I also believe that it is far more rational to be a Christian than it is to be an atheist. And I have lived on both sides. <laughs> and it does not hold together the other side. The more I've looked at it, it doesn't hold together. Um, and I knew that then, just as I knew when I was a Christian in Bible college before I left, I knew then that 
I would never be able to hold it together. Right. And I, you're, you're, is, this is called unapologetic. And I thought to myself when I first heard that, I love that title. And I could have taken that one myself for my podcast because I don't feel like I'm doing apologetics. I'm just giving people, I'm just pointing to the truth. You reason it out for yourself. I can't yeah. bring you to Christ. Um, Christ is real. He is the truth, right? And it's not, it, it's not that I can make you believe or convince you to believe. You have to see the truth. And that's just pointing to Jesus. Yeah. I mean, just, just to kind of address something which I'm sure is occurring to some people listening right now, John, which is um, the question of, look, have you idolized Jenny in some way? Has she become you know the center of your faith and if if this relationship god forbid were to 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 go away or or, or either of you were you know to die or you know anything like that and again you know um not obviously um uh we would not we wouldn't wish any of that but the the point being is what what makes it your faith in jesus and not in this relationship that's obviously had such a transformative effect with with jenny yeah, I tortured myself with that for quite some time. <laughs> but I think it's okay to love someone, um, a physical, real person, and to recognize that Jesus, through that, was a real person. Um, we went out to visit, because we were in Texas for a little while, we went out to visit the, um, the, the hollow cross. What do they call that, love? It's a cross on the hill, but it's like a hollow cross mm. in Texas. And there's a picture of Jesus there washing Peter's feet. And those feet remind me of Jenny's feet because I see those feet and it's like, this is God mm. washing the feet of a human being. That makes no sense. And yet that's real. That really happened. It's, it's like, like Lewis said, this is like a myth but it's real, it actually happened. And that mm. is what is absolutely astounding to me. And do I love Jenny? Yes, Jenny's not Jesus. <laughs> if she dies today, I would rather go with her. But if God has a different plan for me, I intend to keep doing exactly what I'm doing now. A, a lot of people will, will almost be mystified. A lot of atheists will say, look, how, how can you suddenly go from essentially being a paid up atheist to suddenly kind of buying hook line and sinker you know the whole christian story um surely you have to go through some very gradual process of kind of working out what you do and what you don't believe uh, you know are the historical records credible enough to believe in this person jesus did he really die did he really rise again um you know and i think a lot of people kind of conceive that that faith in jesus you know especially if they've kind of approached it from a very intellectual apologetic angle kind of has to be won by intellectual degrees until you've got enough evidence to kind of be able to take that final step or something it doesn't feel like that's the way it happened for you john so so just kind of explain kind of yeah how 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 for you i don't know how would you address that question with an atheist who says how do you justify this john how do you how do you you know how <laughs> give me a reason why i should go in the direction you've gone Right. Well, I've, I, even through atheism, I was always sort of fascinated with Christianity. So I, I know the historical things. And plus, I went to Bible college for four years and I grew up in a Christian home. So it's not like Christianity was um, brand, brand new to me. I understood it pretty well. Um, so as, as I said, when I made that switch, it was initially back to believing hmm. in God. And that was a very gradual process back. It took 25 years, and I look back over that 25 years, literally starting way back in my first graduate school and working my way up through. Um, it was a very slow progression back. Like, I stopped believing in God. I said, that's not true. But I had all of that information still mm. at my hand, uh, still in, in, at, mm. at hand. Um, and it, certainly, I was never so foolish as to deny Jesus ever lived. I, rather, I kind of took the deist approach of, of Thomas Jefferson and said, OK, so he lived. He was a good man, like the typical thing. You know, all of those wonderful things. Jesus was a great teacher. Um, but uh, the, the other things are overblown. They're overdone. Um, but 
those things were still all present for me moving up through. It's not like I, I had to rebuild the foundation. Hmm. The foundation was there. And like I said, what I stopped believing in was God. Hmm. In a certain sense, I never stopped believing in Jesus because I always, through my hmm. youth, through my atheism, idolized Jesus as the perfect man. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I, Is that from training? Yeah, some. But it was also the fact that I... I was pretty much of a nutcase when I was in Bible college and earlier about everything that I do. Mm. And so when I followed Christ, I did a pretty good job trying to cover all of my bases. Mm. <laughs> so I understood Christianity at a pretty deep level. Um, and uh, you know, when I used to argue with Christians about it, it's like, mm, I understand this probably better than you do. <laughs> so I think you should just, you know, understand. I know where you're coming from. Uh -huh. You're just wrong. There is no God. It's a nice thing to think, but it's just a little fairy tale you're believing in. But when the fairy tale stopped being a fairy tale and became reality, I naturally fell back into Christianity. Yeah. No, I get that. It took some time, actually. It was instant. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but that, that gradual kind of recognition that God was there, it's, it, it does feel a bit like maybe it was a slightly C.S. Lewis type journey that you went on there. You know, Lewis had this kind of two-step conversion where he kind of i think he he kind of felt that the weight of for instance the moral argument that he couldn't sustain his atheism um on the basis that he you know to to believe that there was actually no meaning or purpose or beauty or truth or morality in the world and yet everything that made life worth living was in this kind of fantasy realm where there was where it was just chock full of those things and I think he kind of came to the point where he he realized, um, you know, he, he couldn't he couldn't live as an atheist anymore because it didn't make sense of him and who he was and his belief that there is actually uh, justice and morality and beauty and truth uh, in the world. I mean, was it anything like that that was going on in your journey uh, as you kind of started to reconsider things? Well, everything that I've done on the Christian atheism, I just published on Monday our 60th episode. Everything I've done has been kind of spinning out the entire journey mm. um, that that brought me to where I am. And yes, for me, it's like everything I valued through my life. And, and man, I, I love literature. I write poetry. I, I, I've, I've written all my life. I love art. I love music. All of those things fall away into mere epiphenomena if there's nothing anchoring them. Right. Uh, and Lawrence Krauss may be happy with a universe in which all of these things are mere phenomena that will go away. But that doesn't even make sense to me, because what is the universe if it's not something mm. to someone? Um, and it, it, if there is no God, meaning has no meaning. Um, beauty has no existence. Truth. What's truth? There's no truth. And then we can start doing what we've been doing in the Western world now and start undermining the foundations of everything that the Western, Western world has built under Christianity. And I fear the consequences mm. of that, too. I, I think we are systematically undermining what we've built in the West due to Christian underpinnings. And that was something I saw, too, growing up through graduate school. It worried me. And it's something I worried about even back in high school. I thought to myself, why, why are we constantly looking at ourselves and saying we're to blame for all the evil in the world when there's a lot of other real evil out there? And no, we're not perfect, but it seems as though we're at least trying. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so all of those things are playing in the background. Yeah. As I say, you can get the full picture by going to the podcast and, um, you know, listening to the story as you spell it out, as you weave weave the story. It's it's, it's very good. And um, just as we start to, to wind this conversation up, I guess I guess what's interesting about your journey is is that you're not you're not anti intellectual in the sense that you've obviously had this this important kind of intellectual sort of journey that's that's brought you to this point. But there was still that kind of that point at which you had to say i'm not going to get here by reason alone um there's a sort of um you know kierkegaardian type leap of faith that has to happen where you basically say well i either believe that or i believe this and 
to some extent you know that is that essentially where what faith is in the end i mean would you want to kind of give a definition of what what faith is on the basis of your your experience john I, I actually did give a definition of faith in, I'm not sure which episode, it's some, like farther up into this, like in the 40s or 50s, and I talk about mm. a matter of faith. And I give a, de a definition, let me see if I can see if I can come up with it offhand. Um, faith is the willingness to move forward in the face of uncertainty. Mm. That is, we, we live in a world in which our fundamental limitations, our fundamental ignorance, means that we don't know everything that we need to know in order to effectively live in this world. So we have to take a position and move forward with it and see where it takes us and then allow the guardrails of life, reality itself, which is what God says mm. he is, right? When he talks to Moses, I am that I am. Reality itself will provide those guardrails that will correct the mistakes that we make moving forward. In essence, this is the scientific process, right? It's science. And faith really starts with that most basic commitment based on what we've experienced. We say to ourselves, this seems to be the right answer. I'm going to go with it and see where it leads me. And I think that is faith in mm. God as well. He will lead us forward and he will correct us as time moves forward um, by a process of just encountering mm. the real. What does, what does this look, for, look like for you on a practical level now? Um, do you find yourself able to pray now since this, this conversion experience? Do you... Do you find uh, you? I mean, do do you do you, do you see God in in other than just a kind of intellectual sense, moving, acting in your life in in various ways? Yes, for sure. Um, I mean, this is one of those things that gets tricky because if someone were to ask me, "Have you ever had a religious experience?" I'd probably say no. I, I'm not even sure what a religious experience is. Right? Have I seen <laughs> God? Um, has Jesus? Have I felt Jesus holding me in His arms? No, none of that, never. Um, and yet, when I look back over my life, it's pretty darn clear that there's somebody other than me involved in directing it because there have been too many things happening. And have I prayed and had answered prayer? Yes. And I could also explain that away as an atheist, as, you know, um, self-fulfilling prophecies and all the rest. I understand both sides of that argument. But when you make the commitment to see God as central and you start following it forward, then you're going to start interpreting the things in your life as God working in your life. And I see God working in my life all the time um, in so many ways, correcting, um, answering, directing, um, and just in the world around us, right? It is, I can't, I look, I've always loved science, but now every time I read science, it's like, okay, now I understand better where that's coming from. Um, you know, the God of the gaps things is, is to me ridiculous because all of the gaps point to God. You find something new to explain and you say it's explained now, but now you need to explain the explanation, which is far more complex than the first, first thing you were explaining. And so it mm. keeps pointing back to the original maker. And you've got no answer if you're mm. an atheist. Such, a, such an interesting... I mean, and I don't have an answer either, really, <laughs> because God is, God is literally the mystery out there. Um, I think it was Chesterton that said that, right? Um, we, we Christians accept a single mystery, mystery and explain everything else by it, whereas... Everybody else just sort of tries to explain everything and leaves the mystery alone. But then they've got nothing to go back to as the final cause. Well, look, it's been such an interesting and wide ranging conversation. And um, I, I've, yeah, I, I, I would encourage people to go and check out the Christian Atheist podcast. There's a link from today's show and you can hear the full story as John tells it um, over, well, 60 episodes or more now. Um, it's, it's, it's a really interesting deep dive into one person's philosophical uh 
conversion story and and uh and and i think you'll get to know john very well in the process but um thank you so much for spending some time with me john and telling me your story today i appreciate it very much we also have a simple gifts podcast in which i've, I've read all of c.s lewis's surprised by joy a whole bunch of c.s lewis episodes i mean um essays um 1984. So I do, <laughs> I, I try to inform people. Sorry, I'm taking up your time here. But I, one of the questions I often get from people is, what should I read? Well, I think you should read everything in the Western tradition, because all of it, all of it <laughs> it's to God, once once we understand it properly. Amen to that. Well, look, we'll make sure to link to both. Um, and, uh, and it's been really good catching up with you, hearing your story, and I hope people, you know, uh, get hold of the podcast to find out more. But But for now, John, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com.